So the title of today's talk, Karma Without Belief. So some of those other things I said, like your mobile phone being reincarnated as a parking meter, it's a useful simile, but of course it's just a, a simile but not a truth. But because people sometimes don't believe in the law of karma, or they don't even believe in rebirth, but sometimes they miss a great opportunity to understand just some of the cause and effect mechanisms of this, of this universe. Now just imagine for a while, just use some fantasy. Imagine that Mr. Boris Johnson really was the Buddhist who believed in karma and reincarnation. And he realized that in his next life, he'll be reborn in Belgium. <laughs> Would that change his attitude to Brexit? If, he, if Donald Trump realized in his next life, he's destined to be reborn in Syria. <laughs> what would he feel like? So sometimes, uh, Getting a bigger picture of life, of many lives, can actually sometimes change one's attitude and, mor and morality even. The virtue, one understands how this big universe works. And not just in one life, but in many lives, but even there people see, what's the scientific, scientific evidence? The scientific evidence is huge, but if it doesn't fit with one's ideas and beliefs, one rejects it, one can't even see it. One of my best friends, when I was at university, not this university, but <laughs> <laughs> the other one. <laughs> one of my best friends, he was the first Buddhist which I ever met. I was a Buddhist when I was 16, just by reading books. And I thought I was the only Buddhist in the world. I didn't know any other Buddhist. I didn't know where to go to, to actually develop my interest in Buddhism. And so I went to the university, and there they had, like I imagine Oxford as well, has like a, like a society's fair, where you could go to do any sort of club, any society, you can join up to actually pursue your interests outside of academia. And among the first societies I saw, the Buddhist Society of Cambridge University. And as soon as I saw that, I said, I want to join. And there was a young student who was manning the stall. And I said, please sign me up, I want to join. And he said, look, in Buddhism, just come and see. You don't have to join up, just come to a few lectures and see if you like it. And I said, I want to join, I'm already a Buddhist. No, we don't need your money, we're not into sort of such stuff, just take it easy, come and see if you like it. And I got a pound note out of my wallet, join me up. <laughs> and he was the first Buddhist I ever met, he became a lifelong friend. And, and we had common interests. He was also not just a Buddhist. We would join many clubs like the Psychic Research Association, where we go hunting ghosts, experimenting with hypnosis and hypnotherapy, and all sorts of weird stuff, of which I'll tell you something in a few moments. But also, he was a theoretical physicist too. And where I just branched off to become a monk and under one of the great meditation teachers, Ajahn Chah, he continued his career as a theoretical physicist under one of the greatest physicists, the late Stephen Hawkins. And he was a close, I didn't realise how close an associate he was with Professor Hawkins. Because you know, he was featured in the movie of the bio picture of Stephen Hawkins. I think they called it The Theory of Everything, wasn't it? Yeah. 
and he was a close friend who attended, how Stephen attended his, uh, his wedding with Mary, his wife, emeritus professor, retired recently, was the Rector of Physics at Queen Mary College in London. But he also kept his interest in Buddhism and also for many years he was a treasurer of the Psychic Research Society in London. <coughs> one of the head ghost hunters, <laughs> as well as being a dreadful physicist. And to me that was what real science was about. Not just believing what other people were believing, but taking it further, challenging, breaking new ground. As I often say, because I was a fan of Star Trek when I was a layman, to boldly go where no monk has gone before. <laughs> if you know the, the theme of Star Trek, to boldly go where no man has gone before. It's just to boldly go. But to challenge the ground, one of his experiments, which was performed at Imperial College in London, just shows how belief actually distorts the data. It was known as a flower pot experiment. So one of his associates, who was also a well-regarded physicist in London, said he had made a breakthrough and could demonstrate in laboratory conditions levitation. And because he was not a crackpot but a professor of physics, Maybe there's not that much difference, I don't know. But when, when he told his friends to attend, invited them to attend a demonstration of levitation, they took him seriously and they attended. In a lecture theatre similar to this, the Imperial College London, all the professors were seated and he entered the auditorium with holding a flower pot. He put it on the table and told everyone who was now going to demonstrate levitation. There's no wires or anything. But he needed their assistance. To create the right atmosphere, he wanted everybody in the audience to start chanting the Indian holy word, Om. And that was one of his great achievements to get all these conservative old professors, they're all charred together. Oh, oh. He had the videos in ultraviolet, and infrared, cameras, just in case it worked. And as they were all chanting, oh, the flower got lifted above the table. It worked. It was recorded on video. It was with photographs. It actually happened. And afterwards, he interviewed some of those professors. What do you think of that? So a couple of those professors said, What? It stayed on the table all the time. It never even moved an inch from the table. And he showed them the videos. Fake. Doctor, photoshopped. And that was the whole point of the experiment. The flower pot did rise above the table because underneath that table they had installed a hugely powerful electromagnet. <laughs> and at the right time when they turned on the current, if you know anything that powerful, the ampage would make a hum with a 50 cycles per second over in the UK, alternating current frequency. And the ohm, ohm, ohm <laughs> was just to hide the fact it was just an electromagnet. <laughs> Nothing magical about it at all, but the point of the experiment, even though it was a trick, the point of the experiment was that they were seeing something which just could not happen. And because of that, 
It was blocked out of their conscious awareness. To them, they never even saw it. It was so impossible that their mind blocked it out, deleted it, before it even happened. It is interesting the way our mind can actually stop things which are very clear in front of us from being registered on our awareness. It's too impossible to come. If we just do not see it. Or well, a similar uh, experience. One of my friends, who I grew up with as a monk, he was in the Vietnam War. And he was a very tough guy. He got shot in the back of the head in Vietnam. I'm not sure if any of you ever went to the temple in Chitas when it first opened, Ajahnananda. He had this hole in the back of his head, and like an indentation. His, much of his brain had to be removed. And interesting aside, he was a very tough monk. He joined the Marines, the US Marines, because he wanted to get tougher. Before that, he was in a street gang in, uh, in uh, Buffalo, up in New York. As he said, playing for keeps. And when we were young monks together, that the tradition we came from was just so austere. Even the chanting which we did always had to be in a monotone, with no flourishes to it. And then one day there was a chant, we were inviting, at well, the beginning of the chant it's called inviting the heavenly beings to, to listen. And he chanted it melodiously. Something like Purita Sameta Padanta. I'm a bit too old to chant melodiously, but I'll try my best. I used to sing in a choir, but that was on the stands of a football stadium. <laughs> <laughs> but, but all the other monks, they said, You're not allowed to do that. Don't do that, that's bad, that's wrong. You shouldn't chant melodiously. It's not our tradition. And I could see he was crestfallen. He put so much effort into trying to chant sweetly. Then afterwards, when all the other monks had passed by, I whispered in his ear. I said, if I was a heavenly being, I would have come. <laughs> and from that one little bit of praise and support, he became my friend for life. And having someone so tough as your friend was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but he also told me that uh, after being shot in the back of the head and feeling he was told he would be blind for the rest of his life, and he told me that he made a resolution that he would kill himself, commit suicide, once he could because life for him wasn't worth living being blind. And when the bandages were taken off, he could see. Miracle. So there he was, cashiered out of the US Army, this was maybe 1968-69, with a thousand dollars a month pension, which went a long way in the US in those days. He was playing baseball with his friends. And the, the batsman hit the ball high in the air in his direction. It was an easy catch. But then the ball vanished, disappeared out of the universe. And then appeared again a second or two later. He discovered because of his injuries he had a blind spot. And the interesting thing about blind spots is you can't see them. <coughs> That's what they're blind. <coughs> and the amazing thing is, what should be there is the mind fills in. So if you look to the sky, there's a few clouds in there, the mind will actually just fill in the, the, the dots and create what it thought should be the contour of the crowd. If you saw a wall, you would see a hole in the wall, the bricks would be recreated to prove what should be there. It was the mind was creating something to fill in the hole in this vision. It was only when 
that pain based on the trajectory of a ball, his brain wasn't fast enough to fill in that trajectory. And that's when he noticed the blind spot. So sometimes we have to be careful with what we see. Have we got a blind spot? Have we pushed something out from our reality because it just doesn't make sense? Or because it doesn't fit with our worldview? And that's one of the reasons why even as a scientist, sometimes you say, what is there? And can you truly trust it? But what you can trust is some, some of your experiences, not just one or two things, but long experiences. And when it comes to things like karma, your actions, they do have consequences. You can feel they have consequences. You can see those consequences happen, even straight away. Every time I do something stupid and selfish, I feel so bad about it. Because I'm at a university now, I remember the time when I got my degrees and then I went to visit my mother after seven years and she had the degrees on the table and said, I've just got the degrees here. I said, I'm a monk. I don't need them. And I tore them up and threw them in the bin, the rubbish bin. My mother never said a word. I went off to meditate when I came into her apartment an hour later. I saw her, she had rescued all those pieces of paper from the trash can and was carefully gluing them, taping them together again. I felt so, so bad. To me they may not have meant very much, but I forgot what it meant to others. The law of karma, what you do, is not just for you, it's for others as well, which is really important to understand. So when you see the result of your actions on others, that gives you a lot of ideas of what's good and what's bad. And sometimes the results <coughs> are instantaneous. The times when I just pause even though you're tired, is to spend time with someone, to listen to them, to give them importance. It may not mean much for you, but to someone else, it may mean the world. There's one story which inspired me. And it was the case of a, a woman over in New York, an elderly woman who had a very bad cancer, very difficult, aggressive cancer. And her case was passed from one specialist to another specialist because it was just too difficult. It was passed to one specialist who looked at the information of the case and decided to take it on. Not just to take it on, but to give it everything he possibly could give it to call in favours from fellow specialists throughout the whole of the United States, to try stuff which hadn't been done before. He was going to give every effort, every bit of energy, every friend to try and help this elderly woman survive her cancer. And after a year or two, he could tell her that she was in remission and that she could expect many more years of a full and healthy life. But, if you know the US medical system, they may heal the, your body and they will kill your finances. <laughs> so when she got the envelope containing the invoice, the bill from the hospital, she opened it with a lot of fear. Could she afford all the expenses of the many operations and therapies which cured her? But, before I tell you what happened next, when she opened that, that envelope, you have to rewind 30 years, when a young medical student tried to pay his way 
to a university in New York was doing jobs, just like selling something door to door. And I must admit, when I was at university, I did that too. I sold children's encyclopedias door to door. I looked at those encyclopedias, they were rubbish. But I thought, well, you know, you've got to make a living somehow. And one day, I sold one. I saw one of these stupid, ridiculous encyclopedias to this young couple who just had a young daughter. And afterwards I felt so bad, so guilty, I got a very strong sense of morality that I just resigned the next day. I can't do this anymore. I felt so bad about it. And I was, felt guilty for years. Until when I told this story in Australia, after my talk, this lady came up and said, this is just too weird, it has to be true. Because I remember this long-haired student with a beard. And I wasn't always bald. In fact, I had such long hair and a beard, my mother kept on telling me to get my hair cut. And when I became a monk, she said, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> and so, that she came up to me and said, I remember as a little kid, this student came up and I asked, when was that? And it matched the dates. And so this encyclopedia, or so my parents' this encyclopedia. And then she said to my utter surprise, I love those books, that was my favourite books. I took them everywhere with me. Thank you so much. And to me, it was a shock and a surprise. Please come in. There's many things out there. Please come in. It was a shock and a surprise. I was so guilty. It's like, yeah, I over exaggerate. It's okay, that's reserved for you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and so, all that sort of fear of doing something wrong actually turned out to be something good and worthwhile. But anyway, so, this student doctor knocked on one door in New York in the summertime, vacation, really hot. And the woman who answered, the young woman who answered the door said, no thank you sir. And she stopped and said, but, I don't want to buy anything, but you look so tired. Have you had anything to drink or eat today? She said, not since breakfast time. And so she said, wait a few moments. And she went to her kitchen and got a glass of milk and two biscuits, two cookies as they say over there, and gave them to him. Fast forward 30 years, when this elderly woman opened the envelope, she was prepared, braced for a huge bill, but written on the, the bill was paid 30 years ago with a glass of milk and two cookies. That was why that doctor took on the impossible case. She remember, he remembered the address. Checked out it was the same woman living there 30 years ago and was now presented with this incurable cancer. She was so kind, she gave me a glass of milk and two cookies. Now, is a time for repayment. Paying it forward, as they say. And for a glass of milk and two cookies, she was cured of her cancer, and the specialist paid all the bills. I think that was something wonderful which inspires me. I could never verify that story, but I don't care. It deserves to be true. <laughs> <laughs> so, the karma, little things which you do, they do come back to you in weird and strange ways. And they make life rich and beautiful and inspiring. And that inspiration of karma, whether you believe it or not, it deserves to be true. It brings beauty to the world. It doesn't matter just what happens 
you know, later on to the people who were involved in those wonderful incidents. But it makes life far more beautiful and joyful. Every time you do an act of kindness or goodness. Uh, for example, when I was a student Buddhist, that I think it was a Tibetan man, Westerner, came and gave a talk just on our charity work in Sikkim. Now many other monks would come and give talks. And I was a Buddhist, so I thought I had to go to every talk. And most of the talks, I'd fall asleep. They were boring, they were inspiring. They never actually said anything which really touched me. And sometimes there's talks about doing good stuff. Not just talking about the theory, but talking about when you actually put that theory into practice and do some amazing, beautiful stuff. That is what really got me going and inspired me. Even, not this trip, but a previous trip to UK. As I was sitting on the aircraft from the Singapore Airlines, sitting on my seat, just taking off, the captain came out to see me. Why me? And he said, my wife told me to come and say hello to you and give you a gift or an upgrade or something. Because his wife, his wife had come to my talk when she had cancer and listened to some of the advice and got through her cancer and thanked me for it. And so she found out I was travelling on the flight where her husband was a pilot. So you better go and look after that bunk. <laughs> And I've got such a wonderful service. <laughs> so as a monk, you know, sometimes you don't need to be rich to travel first class or business class. Your kindness is paid back to you. All the time once traveling from Australia to Bali to start giving some talks. And I was sitting calmly by my seat, minding my own business. When I was on Garuda Airlines just to be fair to others. I never travel on Qantas. It's always turbulence. I could never understand why it was so, so bumpy on Qantas Airlines until I realised it was called a flying kangaroo. <laughs> bump, 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 bump. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, just flying there for Perth to Bali. As soon as I sat down, as soon as it took off, one of the flight attendants came and saw me and said, Are you right and wrong? And I said, well, I think I am. It says so on my passport. <laughs> and then she put her hand on her heart. I must be your biggest fan. <laughs> I've read all your books. Thank you so much. Is there anything you want? So I got VIP service on that flight. Even without paying for it, she treated me like, like a king. To the point that, in the middle of the flight, when she served all the other people, most of the Australians, going off to Bali, you know, to party, to surf, and she said, can you please come out and get it? I didn't know what for. So I said yes, with all of the beautiful flight attendants at our photo session. <laughs> what I up to the other. And as I was taking the photos, you can see the calls for the flight attendants ringing. All these Australians, we want another beer. So you have to wait until we finish with the buck. <laughs> Well, I remember after having the photo shot, all the Australians and I walked down the aisle back to my seat and looking at me. <laughs> Made them have to do delay. So sometimes, why does that happen? It's sometimes a good karma. If you're kind to other people and generous and just 
spending time with that and to it. It comes back to you. And you can see that happening. But the times you don't mean. You know, one day, I think just going to a funeral service, coming back later, there's no way to get my one meal of the day, except by getting in a little cafe or restaurant, a takeaway. And then the person in front of me was this little old lady who reminded me so much of my mother. And she was wanting to get something. And the thought came up in my mind, and I asked the person with me, can we pay this out of our monetary funds? Because it reminded me so much of my poor old mother. I said, no, there's not more use of my donations. And I would regret that. I should have done that. Sometimes when you have an opportunity to be kind, even though it's stupid kindness, even if it doesn't make any moral sense, any uh, logical sense, it's not the wonderful thing to do. Sometimes that I've pushed myself, you should get sick, you know, go on all my flights to help someone you know, in another country who's sick or who's grieving because their, their husband has died. We call this on Friday night, getting a it was after the talk I was given on Friday nights and receiving a call from a friend in Singapore. This other person I knew, her husband suddenly died. The funeral's tomorrow, can you come? We just finished the talk, so we on the night. Funeral's tomorrow in a different country. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so I managed to find a ticket and got the midnight flight, arrived in Singapore to help the funeral. Yeah, I was really tired and exhausted. But I'm so happy to have done that for someone. A stupid, ridiculous thing. Which no sane monk or nun should ever do. But you do it anyway. Just because it's kind. And those acts of kindness are really inspiring. You never lose out of it. You never actually get sick when you do things which are impossible. That is one of the reasons why that calmness you feel right now, you don't need to wait until a year's time or 30 years' time to see his results. You feel so good about it right now. And so it's one of the reasons why any opportunity you have to be kind is a wonderful opportunity to take. And don't ever miss it. It always helps and works for you. So, in that lot of karma, sometimes that's a good karma, what about the bad karma channels? And you know, sometimes karma works in really weird ways, but it's good to be able to, it's helpful to be able to make use of that idea. I had taught for many years in prisons. I liked teaching in prisons, because strangely speaking, people were honest in prisons. They had lost their reputation, their ego was an all time low. So actually, when you talk them, they were honest with you. And this one time, this prisoner came up to me, an elderly prisoner, well, maybe middle aged, and he said, I need your help at Emperor. I've been put in jail for something I never did. I never did that robbery. I was innocent, and they put me in jail for it. And I, then I knew that people in prison, they only had a little amount of time you know, <laughs> for phone calls. So they could actually try and get a lawyer and right the wrongs of their imprisonment. But I thought I could. I knew a lot of people. Maybe I could take up their case. It's a worthy case. He convinced me, he said, no, I, I'm not lying to you, I lie to other people, but not to you, Ajahn Brahm, I respect you. And no, I believed him. And as I was thinking what I could do to right or wrong, he gave this really cheeky smile. He said, yes, it's true, I've been put in, in prison for a crime I never did. 
but there were so many other robberies where I wasn't caught. I guess it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so how many times you are speeding and you get away with it? Because the camera doesn't catch you. Do you say then it's unfair? I was speeding and I wasn't caught? And how many times? When everyone else in the road was speeding and you were the one who was caught, do you think it's unfair? So sometimes he told me about the law of karma. Don't complain when you get caught and you, you weren't guilty. You didn't do it. There's probably many other times that you did do something and you got away with it. How many things in your life have you got away with? And you're lucky that you were caught. Do you say that's unfair? That you were caught? So this is one of the reasons why that law of karma. And it's not just, you know, thinking, oh, it's my karma, I had to get caught, it's the bad I've done in the past. Because sometimes we forget that karma is not just what happened in the past and paying off your dues, but it's also how you make use of the karma you have from the past. It's not just past, it's the present and how you deal with what you have. So, there were two people cooking a cake. The first person had the very best ingredients. They had beautiful um, whole wheat, gluten-free flour with no um, chemicals uh, within a thousand miles, pure organic, wholesome, good flour. Cost of fortune, but it's very healthy. And they had canola oil, which is supposed to be cholesterol free. They had a milk from free range cows. <laughs> <laughs> they all cows are free range, aren't they? <laughs> Organically grown <coughs> milk, whatever you call it. I don't really call it milk in Australia, we call it cow juice. You squeeze the fruit and the juice comes up. <laughs> and they had honey from beehives in Oxford. Beautiful, pure, healthy honey. And a modern kitchen to cook in. And the very best ingredients. And cook number two, maker number two, they had the very worst ingredients. They had old white flour with mouldy green bits in it. They had to take those out to keep the white flour, the nice flour. And they had cholesterol enriched butter. They had diabetes enhanced white sugar. They had, they had fruit, you know, which was so hard they could use it as bullets in the US Marines. They had, what else did they have? Uh, they had about eggs. They had eggs. Uh, from uh, battery farms, farms here. Yeah. <laughs> and then lastly, they had this really ancient kitchen, wood stove, to cook the, the, the cake in. And in this simile, who made the best cake, the most delicious cake? And it's not always a person with the best ingredients. <laughs> it's what you make with the ingredients life gives you. And that's where you see these inspiring people. Inspiration who are uh, born with disabilities, physical disabilities, maybe with schizophrenia or ADHD or autism. People who are uh, uh, born in poor families, overseas in war zones, and you see them with such bad ingredients, made such inspiring cakes of their life. And it just shows you just what you've dealt with in this life. Your health, your good family, happiness, 
good education, health. That is only a part of your success. But what have you been doing with your ingredients? And sometimes you see these very rich heiresses who have got so much going for them, who squander and waste their privileges. They don't know how to bake a cake, even though they've got the best ingredients. So that is an idea of karma, which I always like to teach people. Yeah, what you've got, what you've got to deal with, is a result of your past. What are you doing with it? How are you making use of the ingredients of your life? And I've seen some people, this is where we get to the deep stuff, the inspiring stuff. There was a group in Perth, Australia, I'm sure there are similar groups in the UK. It was called ASSETS, just the acronym. The Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. These were those refugees, asylum seekers, who were given admittance to the country because they went through hell, or worse than hell, in underground dungeons, cells, in unnamed countries. And the way they were treated, the things done to them, was just unbelievable. The one human being could do that to another. And the only reason I know of this is I was invited to visit one of their groups once. When I went to their groups, I asked why you invited me. They said because they'd used some of my techniques, stories, advice to help people who have been through such bad trauma. Yes, they can come to a country like Australia, or UK, or Europe. Bottomly, they can be free. They don't have to fear torture or trauma or disappear in the middle of the night. But they can never forget what happened to them in the middle of the night, in those dark cells. But they use something which I call, and many of you I think will know, the story of opening the door of your heart. And this is how they made use of it, in a way I never expected, and had beautiful results. When, when they felt safe and ready, not coerced, not forced in their own time, they would sit down comfortably in the feeling of safety and support, closing their eyes, and they'd imagine a heart in their chest. Not a medical heart, which is very difficult to imagine and very complicated and not all that uh, nice to see, but a Valentine's Day heart. <coughs> when they imagine that Valentine's Day heart, I don't know if you know, remember that story of that man who asked his wife what she wanted for Valentine's Day. And she said, told her husband, I'll go with you, that's enough. And she put them in there for long enough to know that's not what she really meant. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, come on, something special for you. Have a good year financially, I can afford something special. So she smiled at him and said, something with diamonds. Something with diamonds. And he smiled at her back and said, okay. And on Valentine's Day, he presented her with a gift. When she opened the package, it was a pack of playing cards. It had 13 diamonds in it. <laughs> that relationship didn't last much longer. That was just a joke. Anyway. <laughs> That's the serious stuff. But so imagine like a heart, like a pack of playing cards, like a Valentine's Day heart, on your chest. Point at the bottom, you know, sort of preview to the top. And to imagine that, then imagine it has two doors in its centre. 
just like the entrance doors. And you open up those two doors. And inside each unit, there is that part of you that you are comfortable with. The part you are proud of, the part you can live with, the part which wasn't treated so badly. But, you imagine looking from in your heart with the doors open, outside into the cold, rainy, <coughs> concrete outside. And there you can see the little boys who were sexually abused. It was just you when you were young, who were beaten for no reason. If you were a woman, a girl, who was meaninglessly raped in some dark dungeon, being mistreated until you felt that you were so wrong, so hurt, so painful. And those parts of you are outside, in the cold, <coughs> not welcome into your own heart. You see them out there, spending most of your life trying to forget them, as if they never existed. And that's part of trauma. You can't forget. Then you imagine a little staircase <coughs> coming from your heart, going out to the ground, and then the part of you which you are comfortable with, inviting all those little yous, little girls, the young women, the young boys, who so badly hurt for reasons you can never understand, saying, come up. Come up the stairs. The door of my heart is open to you as well. Come up. And imagine these tortured little parts of you walking up, scared as hell, trembling until they reach the top of the stairs. They are welcomed inside. One by one. All those people you were ashamed of for no reason. You were frightened of because they hurt so much that memory of the past. You don't try and exclude them. You welcome them in. This traumatic, cathartic, but it works. Such courage. Once the last of those tortured parts of you come into your heart, there's this wonderful sense of not being a victim anymore. This is you. It doesn't hurt anymore. The reason I say this is because I've never one of these people being tortured. This woman in some country, somewhere in the world, and she was at my centre, a young man was talking with her and saying, that's terrible what happened to you, that's disgusting what happened to you. And the woman turned on him and said, what do you mean that was terrible, that was who I am, that's me. I'm not ashamed at all. And I saw the strength in that woman, that she was one who could truly say to anybody else who'd been badly treated or hurt, I know how it feels. She did know how it feels, and much more. She said, I know the way out. And she, my goodness, she did. And that was her meaning. That was her life. To take other people through that process. So like her, her body was free and now her emotions were free as well. She was out of the last dungeon, the dungeon of our emotions, free again. And you can tell all these other people, the men and women have been badly treated. You've had typical periods of your life, unfair, 
why did I have to go through this? What karma did I do? No, we don't think like that. Instead, what can I do with the Lord of God? And those people, they're amazing. I was in awe of them. How they can help and serve what I can never do. You can give the, the basic instructions and open the door of your heart. But to take it to such an amazing place. Wow. How many people feel that because they've been abused? I say this because it's so, it's a common issue now. Child abuse, sexual abuse, both genders, and the damage it can do to your lives, to your sense of integrity and, and respect for who you are. What can you do? And this is one of the things you can do. And what happens afterwards? And this is one of those other stories I've really worked hard on. And it inspires me. When I first did this, it was to a, uh, a group. There was a seminar, a mental health week in Australia. A seminar not for the professors or for the therapists, but for the clients. The people who had been abused. And I was sitting in the audience. I still remember this one woman. He came to me after the talk to apologize to me. Because what they said to me, they said, when you first came and I let you what a Buddhist monk was, I thought, who is this, excuse me, this is the term she used, who is this wanker coming to teach us? It's a bad word in English. And afterwards he said, you made me cry and laugh. But the story which really hit me hard, she said, which means I apologise to you. I always thought I was damaged goods. And you told us a story in the forest. To go into any forest or wood in any country and find a perfect tree. One which is straight, not bent, with all of the, the branches in the right place. With all the leaves nice and green and not eaten by bugs or turned brown. With no uh, damage on the bark or the trunk. You find one of those, and you'll be the first to ever find a perfect tree. But next, you go and find a beautiful tree. The one you always like to have a photograph taken of. The one you always like to go back to. You find the beautiful trees are twisted and bent. They have got many limbs of the, the branches missing. And in the holes, that's where the, the birds made their nests, where the squirrels hibernate. And they've got the leaves, some eaten, some brown, some yellow. And they've got lots of scars on their, on their trunk, damaged from the storms of life. They're the beautiful ones. So these clients of mental health, the ones who had thought they did not belong because of their disabilities are not the same as other people. I explained to them that number one, you do belong by like every bent and twisted tree in the forest. You belong. And number two, if you ever think you're damaged goods, you are some of the most beautiful trees in the forest. The one I would always like to go back to to visit. Turn conventional wisdom upside down and see that what was called disabilities is now something which adds to your beauty to your belonging. Thank you for being there. So these are the attitudes which we need to come there. Oh, God, okay. Damage but beautiful.
even more beautiful. So karma is what we do with what we've got. And so if you treat with bad karma, you know how to deal with it. You become some of the most beautiful, inspiring people in this planet. So welcome. Okay, so I'm supposed to start there. I started inspiring myself by you. Questions and answers now, please. Or comments and complaints. <laughs>